Yo, what up, what up? For Hypebeast Radio, this is Manny and this is Soundcheck, a show that looks to discover the origin story of your favorite artists and major players in the music industry. We ask the questions that you always wanted to get answered and you never know who may pop by. For the final episode of season one, we talked to Tidal's director of culture and content, Elliot Wilson. The veteran music journalist sits down and talks about the art of making playlists, the state of music journalism, favorite memories, and so much more. Welcome to Soundcheck. This is episode 10 of Soundcheck. This is a really special one. Uh, someone that I looked up, I look up to, um, especially as a person who grew up listen, grew up reading hip hop. Uh, I like to introduce our guests. Uh, well, I like him to introduce himself. Elliot Wilson, man. I like 10. Yo, 10, that's a good number. I like 10. Nice, nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> 10 is cool. Um, for those who don't know your story, you've been doing this for a while. You've been killing the hip hop journalism for a while. Yeah. Music journalism. Uh, I guess start us from the beginning of how you well, became. Origin, the, man. Oh, yeah, man. You ain't got do. enough time for that, man. 92. <laughs> um, well, well, let's let's start now and then I'll go back. Like okay. Right now, I'm currently, my main thing is being a title nice. um, as the editorial director of culture and content hip hop. Uh, really starting to get out here and doing some more press because I really want to push our hip hop playlist called Thorough. Mm -hmm. um, I call it Hip Hop's Ultimate Playlist. Like a lot of times, like, I've been in hip hop so long, people always be like, what are you listening to? Like, who do you mess with? What songs do you like? And I, I, so many songs, and so many, I'm, I'm consuming so much, I can never really answer that question effectively. Now I just feel like, okay, look at Thorough. That's like, I feel those are the 50, like, you know, and it's not even just about necessarily like the biggest singles. It's a, it's a combination of, obviously, if Travis Scott just dropped, these are like the five best Travis Scott uh, songs, according to me and according to the team that we have a title. Mm -hmm. And really sort of balancing out that whole thing of like the hits that are still in rotation, they're not played out yet, mm. uh, the new stuff that's good, and making sure it really covers the broad spectrum of hip hop. I mean, the hip hop is such a great space that we have so much going on generational, like the new generation, the six nines and the little pumps is kicking ass, and mm. at the same time, you still got Nas, you still got Jay, you still got Eminem, you still got these whole different things in the East and West and South, it's all covered. So, you know, Thorough, and I think Title in general, we've done a great job of, of creating original content, which I think distinguishes us from other streaming services so it starts with that like just this passion of loving hip lo loving hip-hop and wanting to create content um you know 92 was when i first got into business um just independent wise because i didn't i couldn't get down with the sources yet and didn't know the, who the people who the plug was i couldn't find the plug <laughs> so <laughs> i got with some guys uh, sasha jenkins and haji akiba day uh, they had started independent uh, New York newspaper it was newspaper. We used to print it on newspaper, yeah. uh, covering hip hop, and they had Cypress Hill on the cover. The first uh, issue that they did, and I met them at a party, and I was like, "How can I be down? I'll be the music editor." I always wanted to be the music editor because the music editor at that time, the title music editor meant you basically got all the music before everybody else. Mm -hmm. Like you got the advanced cassette. Like artists would, you know, do their album and turn it in early to the record label, and then the record label would dub dub cassette to the album and send it out to media to review the record. So it was important to have the review attached to the release of the record. Um, so I love that, like it gave me access to music, like every rap fan's dream, the access to the cassettes and albums before they came out. So that was my only career goal, really, to be music editor. So I made myself that with Ego Trip, and then, I, I mean, with, first with Beatdown, sorry. And then um, Beatdown, business-wise, the partners started growing apart, so then me and Sasha started Ego Trip. So Ego Trip started in 94, that was a, a zine that not only was hip hop, but combined like rock and graffiti and skateboarding, sort of where we saw the culture was going. You know, Sasha Jenkins, my partner in it, I credit him a lot of sort of this vision that, you know, hip hop is pop culture and that these aren't separate worlds. We grew up in a world where it's like the urban department was here and pop mm -hmm. was here. And it's like, no, these kids are listening to all this shit together. They're raging in the fucking East Village streets and it's, it's, it's a good time. And we're all drinking 40 ounces and sneaking 40 ounces into movie theaters. Mm -hmm. and. You know, it's a, <laughs> it's a joyous time. So we started Ego Trip, that went really great. And then around that same time, 96, I got the job at The Source to finally be the music editor, which was my only career goal. Uh, so I did that at 25, and that was fun. And then I left that, and then in 99, I took over XXL. XXL was like not far from the top uh, rap mag at the time. You still had Source and Vibe and Blaze and Rap Pages. Um, and a lot of people at that time were going to the uh, digital space in the early first boom of the me new media with that, with the late 90s. Mm -hmm. And I was like, nah, I'm a news, I'm a magazine guy. I'm going to do the magazine. So I did that. And then 
we got into a little thing with the source about who could be number one in that space. So that went on for a very long time yeah. um, to 08. And then in 09, I started Rap Radar with uh, Paul Rosenberg backed me to sort of create a website, create a blog. Um, and now Rap Radar lives now even more so through the podcast that we have, which mm. Connected Now goes through title. You know, we just did an amazing interview with Will Smith for the podcast. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just proud that I'm still, at this point in my career, still able to create content that seems to be resonating and I haven't fallen off yet. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to fall off, man. Nah, and, and, I, and I think you've been doing great because I feel like, um, I always think, of, I always think of like one thing, I always think about life is that it's about seeing like vision. Like that's how yeah. you, you actually, you get ahead of stuff. And so one of the big cool things about, wa- about watching your career is that um, you've been ahead of the curve. Um, yeah. Like, I think that's one, I, that's the thing I, I, I just stood out about you. Like when things were changing, you were already on the, on the next step. Yeah. Um, how do you, how do you see that? What makes, like, well, sometimes I see it and sometimes I'm, I'm blessed that that circumstances um, work in my favor. I think the biggest turning point was that, was that when I thought the whole idea I think the turning point for me is the whole idea of taking over XXL and defeating the source, whatever that means, right? Becoming the biggest in the space. And then when I finally did that, it wasn't this joyous, like, top of the mountain moment that I thought it was going to be because everybody's on not right. Like, all these kids are online. Okay, mm-hmm. so who's SK? What's not right? What's, what's two dope boys? What's on Smash? Mm-hmm. Like, what's, 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 who are these kids on the internet? Who are these kids leaving comments? Who are these blogs? Who are these? So I had to learn that side of it. And, um, we hired Brendan Frederick, who now runs Genius, and we started making XXL website, prioritized, XXLMag.com. And he started recruiting all these different bloggers, like Byron Crawford and uh, Tara Henley, and then Sycamore had a blog, and DJ Drama, and just giving all these creatives this outlet to speak. So, you know, it seemed to be ahead of the curve with that. Um, sometimes, like with the magazine thing, you know, when I separated with them, that wasn't necessarily my choice, but I was at the time still selling a lot of magazines when the economy had kicked in and said it wasn't going to happen that way in the future. So I, but I was still successful when, at the time when I was dismissed. So it looks like I left at the right time, but that worked out in my favor. So I think at the end of the day, I also believe in a lot of times now you have to kind of project what's going to be. I came into t- Tidal, for example, where obviously Tidal had received a, a lot of criticism. I believe there was untapped potential there to like create content, to create these playlists, to create to sort of put a very human touch to this curation in the streaming space, where a lot of stuff now is just built off algorithms and like, well, who's the who's the creator? And there's ways for me to tell. And like, you know, there's been a good, good compliment I got from Billboard calling me a streaming storyteller. Like, that's what I'm trying. So now I can do pretty much doing the same thing I would do, but now I get to do it on this platform, which have access to all the music. I mean, that's the beauty of these streaming services. It's like we have millions of dollars, that are, millions of songs at our disposal. You know, so how do, we, how do we put these songs in a way? How do we engage the people? How do I give you a reason every day to go to Tidal? You know, what, what, what is being connected? Like, where's, if there's a conversation going on online, how does Tidal reflect that conversation? So, you know, I think that I always look at the challenges and I say, well, if I, if I could contribute to this, I think that I plan ahead and I think that we can do this. We can at least, you know, work hard and start to make an impact and show and distinguish ourselves from the place. I think it's always important for me to be different, to look at what's going on and figure out, okay, what can I do that's just a little bit different that, that isn't being done in the space, you know? Um, for, the, for, the, for the playlist, how much of it is analytics as in like the data in the back end as it- Absolutely more, no analytics. Oh, nice. <laughs> It's me and Adele. It's the team. It's 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 our passion. It's our love. It's just, it's again. I look at I look at the charts. I look at you know what's charted. We have we have a whole playlist that really truly reflects Billboard on Title, mm. uh, that we that we distribute from Billboard. Um, so you can literally see what's on your actual Hot 100. But at the same time, like I was saying earlier, Thorough is a combination of not just that. It's obviously going to favor the new. Like we just had a Nicki Minaj album. You're going to see a lot of Nicki because the album just dropped after four years. Yeah. So you're going to see the, the records that we think deserve your attention. Um, and, but then it's also very important to me because a lot of times now you see how the shelf life is very short for these records yeah. in conversation. It's like I still want to listen to my favorite cut off Daytona or kids see ghosts or the whole good music rollout so you'll see a couple of songs sprinkled in still in rotation it's based off that you know it's based off this combination of like and also also to me it's like i always make sure that also that i want from track one to track 50 to be a very smooth uh, listening experience that it holds your attention like almost like a dj and djs have the ability that when it doesn't work to get in and out of records right this isn't working 
yeah. cut. You can't do that with a playlist. So it's even more important to like do your best to hold people's attention and balance out the mix of it. So I may put a Drake song like nonstop next to a song where he's featured on just to sort of maintain the way a DJ would DJ a party. So it's just a lot of thought put into it. It's, it's a living, breathing document that we're, we're constantly changing. If records come out earlier, if Chance drops four songs, you know, the day before the big release, then we'll put those songs in rotation. Mm-hmm. So I love it, but it's not, yeah, it's not based on that. And there's no overall thing of, of like feeling like we have to hit certain marks. I feel like it's just, if I, I love hip hop and I think if anything, I rely a lot on what I see on social to get a gauge of like, okay, this is important. I mean, obviously you look at a moment like what Travis Scott has just created, yeah. you know, with all respect to YG and Mac Miller, you know, he took over that, that week mm-hmm. and, you know, and made a body of work that really, you know, lifted him up as, in his stardom. And I think that, you know, if you look at Thor or the Travis Scott Essentials playlist, it'll reflect that. And I think that's very important that now there's a place that sort of reflects the conversations we're having online every day. Yeah. I also like that you touched on the sequencing because I feel like when some people think of playlists, just think of like these hot songs and yeah, throw yeah, them throw whatever. The hits up. Yeah. But then the throw sequencing the is important because you needed like a flow to it. It's Absolutely. just because you just like, I like this and you're like, oh, this is weird. Yeah, skip yeah. it. And then you probably skip the whole rest yeah, of yeah, it. Yeah, you got to nail them with the first 10 songs. I mean, that's from all data we've ever seen across the board. It's like, you know, people really, you know, they're, they're, they're going to, it's like the radio mentality, like people will zone out. Like if you can't hold their interest, you know, the whole interest for 50, 50 songs is amazing if you get able to accomplish that. So that's our challenge every week. But, you know, we usually update it whenever songs drop, especially Midnight Thursday is the big drop. So you'll start to see new songs sprinkled in on Friday. But then you, usually by Monday at noon, that's when I feel like you can best assess the thorough playlist. Like this is what we're rocking with this week. Until the new records drop on Thursday. Nice. And then Playlist Importance has gotten. Thursday midnight slash Friday morning. Playlist Importance, <laughs> playlist Importance has gotten like really strong because I feel like the playlist is now kind of where you break records. Where it's a mm-hmm. sense of just like, um, that's where people are listening to most of their music. It's just like, I just want to listen to what's happening right now yeah. instead yeah. of just consuming an entire album. I haven't got credit yet for breaking the rest. That's my goal. I want to get to that credit. I mean, other streaming services have gotten credit for, for being instrumental in the breaking of a song. I mean, you know, success has many fathers, but yeah, I mean, I think that at the end of the day, that is a goal. Like, it's also just even exposure, like, you know, like to, to really bring to light certain records that, that may get overlooked. Because again, you look at the landscape, we're getting so much music. It's such a rapid pace. You know, the, the fight to gain interest, the fight, to, the bigger fight to sustain interest, it's fascinating. And it really, it really disturbs me how people are so quick to move on sometimes. From, from, it's, there's been a lot of good music. Like, Flatbush Zombies dropped a really good album. Yeah. Like, things get lost in the mix because we're so, you know, insatiable and, and artists feel that. And they're delivering, like, we may get another Cardi B album. You know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? We watched she just di- delivered well on her debut, which there was a lot of pressure to do that. So, you know, I think that that's why Playlist I think is also important because you can't keep track of it on your own. Mm. I think it's damn near impossible. I think that, you know, what's happened is that, you know, I think that what you get from Tidal and why we've been able to sort of, you know, get people on our side and really connect to what we're doing is that we're people that are all passionate about music from from Jesus to Brenna. Jesus does the Latin stuff. Brenna does more of the rock stuff. Me and Adele are more hip hop and R&B. And everyone has input. There's William, there's a guy Romel, you know, playlist managing. Like we take all of this very serious and we rely on our personal taste. We rely on what we see out there, what, what's really resonating based off what we see in terms of the charts and and social and, and all our tips and our sources and what we see and make those decisions. And they're living and breathing and they're constantly changing. And I think that, that I think that's what's resonating with people. People are connected to that. And I think that there's even more value for what we're doing. And Tony Javino, who's the boss, like we're actual magazine. Most of us come from a magazine background and we're pretty much storytelling the way we would whatever publications worked at before, whether it was a billboard or a, a slam or, or XXL. And it's like, I think that that's important that the curator is even more valuable in this landscape. What do you think is a job for a curator to be? Like, what is like you would say it, it's the most important thing a curator should do? I guess the more probably just to stay engaged, to stay engaged in terms of, of, of you know, being open minded to the, again, to keep up really, to be engaged and to keep up because you're constantly, there's so much stuff to go through and so much stuff to listen to. You know, every pretty much, you know, Every Friday, there may be five to ten major rap album releases. You know, I go through all of them the way I would go through back in the day at the source and have a cassette tape and 
listen to it again and listen to it again. Like I always work to the sound of the music. So I think it's really just putting yourself in there and like really yourself making your connection to the music. I think it starts with you. I think that's also the key to interviewing. Like when we do these podcasts and we have great moments, it's like there's always this I got you moment, whether it comes from me and a lot of times it comes from Dot, where it's like, oh, you really listen to my stuff. Like you really listen to track seven, the third verse. In the last line, mm. and you connected to that part, like you know, give artists that respect. I think that's what is getting lost, right? Because we're getting so much music. You know, there's a challenge for consumption. There's a challenge of true consumption yeah. of really sitting and listening to it. And I want all our playlists to reflect that that passion isn't lost. That we're up for that challenge. Yeah. Like, drop another album. Hit us with a motherfucking double album. We're ready. Like, we're like we're gonna we're gonna deal with it here at title. Like, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make sure. You know, it doesn't get ignored. I, I, it's funny you say that, but you say it about the challenge part because I remember I think last week Carl Cherry tweeted this. He was just like, "The we getting so much music at at once. It's just like I don't think I sat with an album in like a minute. Meaning, just like he doesn't just like really consume the total album. Like he's like, I'm still listening to albums back at like that's released in March and yeah. and um in April." But but just got ten albums that just came out today. And it's no, it's a it's a constant challenge. But I do see a lot of people. Though, I think it. But I, as hard as it is, I do people say. I do see people say a lot of things like, like Nipsey Hustle. Like that album is still fucking fire. amazing. That album is still one of the best albums of the year. So you know, a lot of times, even back in the day when the pace was slower, a lot of the top of the year albums would always get lost in year end discussions. Like it'd be like we we built the industry off the big fourth quarter release. Mm. So a record drops from September, September on. It kind of steals those best year-end playlists, right? Yeah. That dropped in November, and that's all we talk about. And it's time to do the year-end list. And it's like, well, the album that dropped in February, it's not in rotation the same way. So, but I do see people, a lot of people champion Nipsey's record, which I think is great. Yeah. So, I just think it is a challenge. You have to really take time to do it. And if, I think that's, our, and I think that, you know, for gentlemen like ourselves, that is our job. That is our responsibility. You know, and and but here's the thing: we, I think we all get frustrated. We can get frustrated at times, but at the same time, you know, we got to deal with it because I think we're we with our platforms, we have the most power, and it's even more important that we stay dedicated and we sort through it. The power thing, I think, is um, a key because I think um, I think the fear is that you don't want the playlist to only be representative of the top projects that come out, but mm -hmm. more of just like a a very not that's the better words um, a thorough look into what's happening in music meaning new artists with only like two thousand dollar followers on Twitter to like Drake yeah. you like like get that whole grasp of everything just so as a consumer you want to see like who's next yeah. um, and and also see what's what's right now yeah well we try different ones that like we have a, a one called viral hype that we're building with sort of, of these younger artists that break through that way. Mm. Even now, when you look at also on the other side of it too, like a lot of not, a lot of times now, it's hard to even distinguish. You know, what are we claiming as hip hop? This bridge of rap and R and B, where it's rap. We call it rap bars and melodies in a sense, where it's like, you know, like we were talked about the homie Ty Dolla Sign. He he never spits a sixteen, but he's hip hop. Yeah. So we claim him. He's in our space. So it's like, where do you put that? LMA produced by DJ Mustard is right there along with. You know, a Drake jaded, mm -hmm. you know, which he's singing on. So those lines are blurry. So I think there's always that constant thing. But yeah, you're always looking to sort of be behind a new artist and, 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 and see what's going on there, what the new thing is, you know. Even someone like 6ix9ine, like he was somebody that built off that. Like, you know, he, and a lot of times these younger artists, their goal out the gate is to, is to make these big records, mm. like to make these records that are going to like galvanize right out the gate. Mm. And they're going to be very selective about what they put out. Like their output is going to be very smaller. Like we used to do like back in the day in the mixtape era, Artists would put out just tons of music and throw it out there, and hopefully a song sticks. Like track seven off this 18 track mixtape, all of a sudden it's starting to get in play. But now you see artists that every release is important to them. Every release is like, you know, and if they get that record, like a, a, like a flip, like Leave Me Alone, uh, De Niro, uh, Flip De Niro. Yeah, Flip De Niro. It's like, we're not going to uh, pull the plug on that song yet because we still feel like there's ways to take that song. Yeah. And then when we're going to get the major artists to jump on it. Like, so you really feel part of that whole ascension of a song. So I think that, in some sense, I think playlists have helped us appreciate songs more yeah. in, the, in, the, in the process of it. You know, like I've seen other places where it's like, you know, you get so caught up in your number of streams, but at the end of the day, it's like, it's all about resonating at the end of the day. You know what I mean? And the song, there's been songs like, even like, um, I hit Wale the other day, like when Black Bonnie, you know, obviously we supported that record early when the project came out and Wale's dropped really good EPs this year. But when he did the video for Black Bonnie, I put Black Bonnie back in Thorough's rotation. You know, if Baca drops his album, 
you know, Live Up To My Name, I think is still a great record. And I'm going to put that there because I think that still represents the album yeah. in a sense. And that's his best, strongest output to put in there. So I think the beauty of Playlist is that unlike radio, we're not as stagnant. Like we can move records in and out very fluidly and, and, and time it that way. Yeah. What do you think uh, rap music is right now? We're, we're stay. <laughs> <laughs> It's good, bad, and ugly, like it always is, man. No, but I, like I said, I think that we've never seen a time when um, there's so much content and there's so much diversity and it's, there's less about like a generational battle as the way it used to be, as intense as it used to be. I feel like everybody has their lane and sense of like being comfortable in terms of like that there's a vision of hip-hop that we want to be, a, a young artist would love to get to a Jay-Z level. You know, but at the same time, we need to respect that young man and his movement and what he's doing. And Lil Baby, you know, you see the power of Jay-Z and, and his wife tearing down a giant football stadium. And then you see a, the energy of a young little baby with maybe in a club that got 500 to 1,000 people and everybody got their lighters up and they're losing their mind. And both things are dope. Yeah. Both things are what they should be. Little Baby should be there. Jay-Z should be there. Yeah. And there's no, then that's, that inspires me that there's that two things going on. And there isn't a thing that of like you in hip hop, there's some sort of like expiration date, like that you can't be older in your forties or up and be relevant. And we've, we've, we've killed that. You know, you see that every day. Like it doesn't matter as much. It matters about what you're doing and the, and the content you're creating. Yeah. With hip hop turning 45, um, not too long ago and just, looking at the year so far i'm just like wow man we hip hop such a good place because it's so diverse we have all these huge artists coming out with great music these all the young artists coming out with good music it's just so many different types yeah. people are now being broken up into sub genres <laughs> like it's now like oh that's not just hip hop it's this or it's that is this and just as a as a as a fan and as a as a music lover and also as a journalist is is exciting and it's kind of inspirational just to yeah. see like all the different faces, um. but I think the audience. I think that I think social is a key part. Yeah. I think that the that the audience being so connected to it, I think, has kind of pushed it also. Mm. Like you know, the, the the magazine era when we were these curators that were like had the access that the fan didn't. You know, we would hold people to task, or we would be critical of things, and we would inspire the way the art was created. I think that the beauty of what's happening now is that for as good, bad, and ugly as social can be, and it can get really ugly and be very negative, you know, I think it also just creates this, this, this landscape or just this engine that's constantly running that through Twitter and through Instagram that hip hop artists are accountable to that. And like, I think it's, I think it's actually pushing, pushing the envelope and, and out, out of that is coming this great art, yeah. you know, that you're held accountable. Like, where you been? Like, where's your song? Like, what's, like, you're not, like you can't go away anymore. Mm. Even if you disappear, it's, it's a celebrated hiatus and then you, you return. Nikki was off social for a while. Now she's back, you know, stronger than ever in that sense. And, you know, there's no way to really hide. And I think that that's probably actually also helped push what's make the music so, everybody's so driven now. Mm. You know, there's, there's accountability. Yeah. Where do you, uh, my next question, where do you think hip hop uh, music journalism is right now? I think journalism is being done in unconventional ways. I think what we're doing at Title is music journalism. Mm. You know, I think it's about keeping a more of an open mind. I think that we, we obviously can always have a moment where we, we, we shed a tear and somebody shows me some <laughs> magazine cover I did uh, 10 years ago and it's like, holy shit, this is amazing and, and I miss those days, I miss the tangible, I miss, you know, it's okay to miss those things, but, you know, we have evolved and, and it's different. I think, I think that that's what's going on. It's story, storytelling being done in different unconventional ways. It's being done through social, it's damn sure being done through these streaming services. I think that's what's important. I think that... You know, we at Title seem like we've been at the forefront of that, of, of the idea of really embracing podcasts in a real way with our title.com on air and me being able to bring Rap Radar podcast, which we did like 100 episodes with CBS and bring it over to Title. And now like we did 40 episodes with them. Mm. You know, Angie Martinez trying a podcast, you know, things that we've done, like in creating, you know, original content. Angie interviewing Meek Mill live on Title. I'm about to interview Nikki. Uh, for Crown live on title. Hopefully by the time you hear this, it'll be still on title. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you missed it. But no, but like that, like Crown, having been, and I did a Crown with Migos too, like bringing my brands that I have had in the past, like Crown and Rap Radar Podcast to title. Also at the end of the day, I think that we've done a lot of incredible original content. Every time you go to title, you can pinpoint different things that weren't out there the day before. We give, I like to think that we give you a reason every day to go check out title. And that's really what's important, most important because people are very very passionate about what streaming service they back and the experiences of how they got there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, unfortunately, they feel like they can only choose one. 
you know, myself, I'm open to everything. But, you know, I want to make sure title is respected in that conversation. I think that we, more so than anyone, really give you a reason every day that, like, oh, I didn't know there's this new documentary here. There's this new video content piece here. Oh, there's a new podcast. Oh, there's a new interview here. Like, we really push ourselves to really create original content just like we would do at a magazine. Yeah. What do you think is, is next? Because I feel like Playlist is now, also mm -hmm. podcasts. Are, Podcast is also now. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the next the next step? Never really great at predicting. Or <laughs> 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 nah, nah. Um, I don't know for sure, but I, I I like to think when it's time to know, I'll know a year before it does. <laughs> you know, that's usually what I like to say. Um, one of the things that I feel like as um, as we have evolved, I think mm -hmm. we have gotten more access. We're now getting more access. We're getting more close to. With music, with hip hop, especially hip hop being so big, and now we're getting more access, we're getting more close to these artists, and we also getting more in depth into their lives. But I also worry about are we becoming too close with them, like in a sense where we can't be critical? Because I feel like yeah. um, there's instances when it's like the NBA. Mm -hmm. It's like um, NBA players have so much power, and so they can kind of like not control the narrative, but take over it. Yeah. And then the reporter or journalist um, who is critical is then put to the side. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like that's kind of what's happening with music where it's just like these artists now are becoming so powerful and so like um, big names and it's along with music is that is are we able as music journalists to call them out or not even call them out just yeah. be just be like hey this is something we didn't like that's always a, that's always a challenge to navigate those relationships right like we say like it's an up and down situation like any artist you get cool with technically mm. you're gonna have ups and downs with because once you become someone that they know who they, who you are and they resp and they like you or think you're cool enough to go get invited to their shows or they know your face and you've interviewed them a few times you build a report and that there's a face to that name so what you write and what you do you're you're responsible for so there's a constant need of navigating those relationships but i think what's also important is i think artists are more empowered themselves and have desire themselves to be media entities and create content their way mm -hmm. that's why you see the way you know joe budden has embraced his position he's in or nori nori before him um and whether it's whatever, you know, it's a, I'm going to create a documentary with my creative team, you know, like, like if I'm, if I'm J. Cole and my, my, my guy, Scott Laser, I'm creating my, the, how you say the name, Scott Laser? Thing? I'm creating my, like, so I think the artists themselves want to be empowered and create their art. They're doing, they want to deliver their own cover story at the end of the day. So I think that's always the balancing act too. So that's why we see a lot of the bigger artists pull back and you don't, they don't need your platform, this specific platform for validation. You know, it's all content creation. And I think it, now we're competing on a different level where it's like, you know, they're, they themselves are trying to control the narrative in a way that I think that's different than sports in terms of what they put out there and how they, how they create. You think that makes our, I guess, they, they become our, like, competitors, so to speak? Or oh, just absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. You know, but that's but that's what it is, though. But I think it's better for the fans. I think it's, it's good. If, it, if you're dedicated to it, I mean, I respect Joe. Joe is dedicated to it. He's he's made that transition. You know, in the beginning, you could feel him still being struggling with that. But now he's embraced it. And totally. He's all in it. I'm yeah, I like how Joe is doing it. I don't know, like especially I, I think it made I was 100 percent in after the the Drake. Ep, um, when he broke down Drake's yeah. album. More than a lot of people over with that. And I was like. He nailed it. I was like, well, see, that's the thing. Well, that's the thing I've always faced, right? And that's a great example. How Kosa had this famous book, I Never Played the Game. Mm. Because the biggest thing you always have against somebody who's like, thing is, it's, it's the color commentator versus the play by play person, where it's like, you think you know hip hop, but what do you really know, Elliot Wilson? You're not in the MC. You never rapped. You never put out a single. You never made an album. What, like, how do you know more about hip hop than me? Like, and then, so then the idea is that that person who's of the game, he played the game, is always going to be the more authoritative figure than the person who didn't play the game. Yeah. And I've countered that my whole career, yeah. in a sense, you know? Exactly. But even Jay, like, we playfully will tease. He thinks he, you know, he's the same kind of mentality. He wrote his own book, right? He's a best-selling author, right? You see how many bylines he has in, in uh, New York Times, where he wrote something, or other major magazines. Like, so he takes that seriously, for example. So, it's, it's just, again, it's always that tug of war. But I think that, you know, if the dedication is there, I think people respect it. And I think that artists now are their own entities of that, like, we come, I come from an era of the press release. No disrespect to my publicist, here. Shout out to her. <laughs> but, like, you know, artists themselves will put out their statement 
through social media most times. Yeah, a lot. Now, there's still public, the need for publicity, a need to shape things, a need to deal with things, but artists have so much access to get their message out on their own, mm. you know, you have to find that balance because, because the tools are at our, our disposal. But, you know, I think it makes it exciting. Yeah. What's it like interviewing Jay-Z? <laughs> That's a really good question. No, I'll tell you why it's a good question because I, w- I tell people when people like young artists, t- I mean, not young artists, young writers and young people that want to get in media will ask me questions about like interview tips and those kind of things. I always surprise them because I say you have to listen. You have to shut up and listen better and not talk over your subject and do those type of things and really you know make them feel comfortable. And I think I learned that more so from interviewing Jay in the magazine era when I got to interview him a few times. And obviously being an artist even then of a high stature, you know, it was rare to get him to do a sit down. And if I was started to interview him and I was kind of bullying the conversation or kind of talking over him or interrupting his train of thought, he would just literally stop speaking. And that would kind of hit a, hit a pothole in the interview. Mm. So out of my respect for him and finding a better rhythm, I learned to be like respect the subject better and like know how not to step on their thing. And also kind of go where their conversation's taking you and not worry about, I didn't get to ask about this, so I have this idea and I want to, like every interview me and B-Dot have ever done, we agonize after because we didn't ask about this. You're going to have that. You're going to have the big miss. It's going to be the thing that you forgot to ask about. Like it's just, it's, oh, you didn't find a rhythm to get that in, more importantly. Mm. Like there was never opening. It's like a great song that couldn't fit the sequence of the album. Doesn't mean it's not a good song. I just didn't see where we're going this 15 track, track list. Like, that question was great, but I didn't see. I never had an opening to really ask that question. Oh, I saw an opening. I could have asked it right when you watched the tape back. Oh, there's an opening. I could have asked that then. So it's really about trying to create every interview into a conversation and find that rhythm. And I think that the, the early days of doing magazine stuff with Jay and, and doing those type of interviews that were the bigger interviews because I was very selective about what I would do. And I was very more so about, as an editor, putting other people as writers in positions of getting the content. Mm. Like this whole transition of me being out there more is this latter part of my career because then before... I was more editor, I was more behind the scenes. I wasn't myself the one with the subject doing the story mm. on tape or on camera. Um, so I think that that's what it comes from. I think that, that man's been very important in my life for a lot of things and I think that that's part of it, that you know, I learned to become a better interviewer, but it's still always a challenge and you know, you're gonna make mistakes, but the biggest thing now that kind of worked to my favor is that with my dedication, and being a veteran and being in for so long, you know, I think people come in with some measure of respect for me. So we're both kind of committed to this process of trying to have a good exchange. Like I said, when you're younger, you have to still earn that respect. You know what I'm saying? I'm sure you've seen yourself as a young journalist come in and like, you know, you, you, the memories you have of interviewing somebody a few times, you've built that respect, you built that report. Now they see your face on the red carpet, they see your face at this event and they know who you are. And that's really what it's still always about, whether, you know, the paradigms change of the kind of places that we work. It's still really about that. Nice. Um, yeah, you did a lot of famous covers at XXL. Yeah. Yeah. What is, and I always hear stories, I remember Vanessa used to tell us stories about like, man, this cover, this, we had to do this and this and this. Yeah, Vanessa probably knows more than, <laughs> than I, I remember at this point. I would uh, guarantee. Um, what's one cover that you did that stood out and the story behind it? Just, like just one? Or, or, or multiple, <laughs> or multiple. Where comes, pick one, pick one. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm curious. Well, I always talk about MJ50. I always talk about yeah. um, Baby Wayne with their shirts off in New Orleans. That was legendary to me. I, those are some of my favorites. Uh, Nas burning the magazines, which led to the uh, the Benzino incident. Cause that actually happened before that issue came out. Yeah. Because they thought it was just going to be him burning ex, uh, burning the source, not burning both. But the idea was he was going to burn both. And it was like, F y'all, because we don't rock with media anyhow. Um, yeah, each one has a story. I tried to do that once, actually. One time, I had an idea that I was going to make a podcast where I, and it's probably still a good idea, where I would just, the whole podcast would be about one issue of XXL, and I would I would open it, I literally have the issue, and I would go page by page, and I would just start to rattle off my reflections of certain things, and or somebody could ask me questions about certain things, and literally get 30 minutes or so content from, because every page has a story. You know, that was the thing, too. But again, I think that I come from an era where, even like look at it now, you don't see my, you don't say, it doesn't say the thorough playlist created by Elliot Wilson and Adele or all these people. It just says created by Tyler, mm-hmm. right? So a lot of the playlists that my hand's been on in terms of overseeing, you know, don't, they don't bear, none of them bear my name, right? If we have a freelancer, we may put that person's name, you know, but what Adele does and F Boogie, shout out to F, 
from up north trips. He contributes a lot too into the process. It's a process and it doesn't have my name on it. It all says title, right? So it's really just about like the content itself. You know what I mean? Like 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 behind the scenes part of it. Same thing with XXL. Like even though my name wasn't on the show improve when we first did Rick Ross, I still signed off on that page. I still made a decision, was part of the decision of who interviewed Rick Ross at that time. And every page to me means something. It's like every playlist means something to me, but it doesn't have to have my name on 100%. it. hundred so, yeah. percent. I think because uh, the reason I brought that up, because um, it's such a different time then and now when it, for like making these the content. Like mm -hmm. before, there wasn't no like Twitter to find who the contact was or Instagram to, <laughs> to see where they at. Or it was like, you got to like, I got to call this person and get, try to get this person to Absolutely. somehow try to get this guy to meet me here at this time. Yeah. Um, yeah, the turning point for me was when I remember when I started, um, when I took on the challenge to do Respect Magazine, with shout out to Jonathan Rango. I literally didn't know Rick Ross, and we just started exchanging DMs and literally set up the whole thing with us going through each, communicating with each other through social media. Didn't have his number, didn't, and, you know, didn't necessarily have a contact, flew to Miami. All of it was kind of done just us connecting on social media, mm -hmm. you know, direct that way. And I heard he did a lot of business that way. I heard he pretty much built MMG through that. Like he would, he DM Wale and DM Meek and like a lot of that business he did was through social media. So I think that was a turning point where I was like, wow, like that's, it's amazing that we're really using these platforms and doing business in a different way where it's like, before it was all about that. Like, you know, you had to go through Dame Dash to get business done at Rockefeller. Mm. You wasn't getting to Jay. You wasn't getting the bigs. If it was media, all roads went through Dame Dash. I had 8 million Dame Dash meetings. You know what I'm saying? Like everything had to go through Dame yeah. at that time. So you, and you had that and then certain things you had publicists, like certain publicists, you had to deal with this publicist and to get the, to get the artist, to get the access. And now, you know, it's still needed. It's still a part of it, but there is more of a direct line to artists yeah. per se. Um, do you, what's your, I, I, this is probably like a tough question, but um, what are some of your favorite projects so far this year? Uh, albums, you say? Uh, albums, mixtapes, EPs. Yeah. Man, I go on forever. Nipsey, I say Victory Lap, uh, Pusha Daytona. Uh, this is just rattling. Yeah, no order. Yeah, yet. no order. Uh, no order. The Carter's album is amazing. Uh, again, I'm, I have my own version of the Drake album that's amazing. Like a lot of albums, <laughs> you know, some of these albums are a little long for me. <laughs> so I might make my ten, my ten song version yeah. that's cranking with my sequence because you know I think I'm a, a playlist master now. So <laughs> let me show you how to sequence your album better than you did. That's always a challenge. Um, who else do I like? Who's, who's kind of slept on? Oh, Gunna. Listen to a lot of Gunna. I was late on that dri uh, Drip Season 3. Right? It's drip yep, Season 3? Yeah. 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 So I like his voice a lot. Lil Baby. Like, a lot, man. Just, you know, again, I think that that's, you know, and see Travis's Ascension is amazing. I think there's a lot of great stories in hip-hop. Nicki coming back strong. Cardi still out here winning. The fact that we, I was saying, telling somebody, it feels like, I don't know if we've had two female artists at a, like a high level, you know, that you can make the argument, well, I, I still love Cardi, Cardi's number one, or I still love Nicki, she's number one, you know, you know, and that reminds me of when I was the source and we had Foxy and Kim, and they hadn't even put out their albums yet, but the whole energy behind that was just so exciting, like, Foxy, no, Kim, like, the energy of that, I remember the first cover, first cover I was a part of at the source, I didn't really work on that issue, but they had that cover with Foxy and Kim on the cover together and how huge that was, so, I really feel like we're in an era there where it's like, wow, the female rap game and you still have Rhapsody and all these other young voices, the, the sister from Philly. Uh, um, which one? Made the one minute oh, Tierra Wack. Tierra Wack. Tierra Wack. She's um, fire. All these, all these young talents. Like, and, and again, like, and with his crazy ass six, six nines and all that, little pumps and all these kids and Gunna. Like I said, I think it's, it's, it's great. I mean, it's, there's so much to listen to. There's so much, there's so much content. And again, I, I feel like, unfortunately, the Flatbush Zombies and these kind of other artists that have made really strong albums this year are getting lost in the mix. And I think it's important to go back and, and revisit that. And that's the beauty of streaming, that you always have access to it. You always get into that mold. You always can go back and appreciate it and, and dump through our playlists on the hip-hop side and see how that truly has reflected the conversations that have happened in hip-hop this year. Like, that's to me is a timeline, just like anything, just like on social. If you look through, like, our genre and our playlist and the, and the history and the order, it's like you can kind of get a gauge of, oh, this is what we were talking about two months ago. And these playlists kind of reflect that conversation, you know? Well, um, what inspires you now? Like what, what like, like gets you like, man, let's, let's go kick some ass today. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> um, I think the music still inspires me. Like hearing that song, like I need the, I need a soundtrack to my shenanigans. So um, 
I, I still love the, the joy of working the title. Also, working at a streaming service is that you, I go back to having access to music before it comes out. You know, we, I can't say anything in the tweets about it. But like I signed NDAs and we have, our, you know, files are delivered and we have access to files and then they all come out on Thursday and the big releases and stuff. So that's the drive to me. Like, OK, what's coming out this week? Like we, we get a list of uh, and that's the thing, too. Like we'll, we'll, we'll collectively as a team come up with lists of per genre of all the big releases that we know are coming. But this is the surprise era. Oh, someone so decides chances. Like I said, mentioned earlier, chance to rapper decides. He wants to drop four songs, we're gonna get those files. Like Gambino decides he wants to put out a song or now he wants to put, two, put out two summer songs. Like, so you're just constantly part of that engine where you know, I think that's what drives me is that I'm, I'm still in the front seat of knowing what's gonna happen. Like, okay, we are gonna get this record on Friday. Like I'm hearing this orbit. Well, you know who Pump Fake's the worst though? I will say it's Kyle, I was thinking about that the other day. Is Young Thug, <laughs> oh. Young I love Young Thug, and I can't wait. I can't wait to see him on the on the tour with Cole. But we'll get our you know our title big list of the releases, and Thug will be in there all the time coming out Friday. <laughs> Never nope. come out Friday. Nope. Come on, Thugger. Everybody wait for Thugger slime be language. Faking like like crazy. I thought slime slime language and all that. I'm like typing the back end trying to find slime language. <laughs> like maybe it's under. Maybe he changed his name Change again. His name. <laughs> Jeffrey or something. He be pump faking, man. Uh, Come on, Thugger. Yeah. Stop pump faking, we man. Do need, we do need to. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, so last part. If you if, uh, if, a, if you were talking to a young journalist yeah. uh, that's trying to make it in the music industry, um, what are some of the, the do's and don'ts you'll tell him? Tell him or, her, him or her. Start doing it on whatever. Stop waiting to get the go sign. Make it, create your own go sign. Like, stop waiting for me or anybody to give you an opportunity. Start pretending like you already have the opportunity in the sense of how you would be work how would you already be carrying yourself from the way you carry yourself on like what from the from the most basic thing of what your email address is like what should be your name or something professional other than you know I don't think people are really still doing like hot and mama 67 but you know just in general like you, how would you present yourself like start manifesting it present yourself that way if your email at work would be first initial last name and your email currently a gmail should be first initial, last name, right? And whatever you're trying to do, whatever story you're trying to tell, whatever you think is missing and whatever opinion is not out there, start sharing that opinion. Start putting that out on Twitter. I mean, we saw Taxstone and people like that really use these platforms to put their, their voice out there. So no one's stopping you yet. You don't need me to give you permission to do that. You have to start already doing what you want to do on whatever small level without compensation, mm -hmm. which will lead to recognition, which will lead to compensation. So just start doing it. There's no green light go that anyone's giving you. We're only going to give you green light go once we see you out there doing it. Yeah. You know what? You get this question a lot about people asking you how do you better your brand as a writer, and I, that gives me you don't have a brand. exactly it's the Oprah thing. That gives yeah. me a look. I'll be like, That's wait, the best clip ever. I'm gonna play the Oprah <laughs> thing for everybody. <laughs> everybody see the Oprah clip. Was, Oprah's Oprah's to, to paraphrase. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Oprah was being interviewed for something, and she said that the biggest thing she gets frustrated with. The younger generation, no disrespect, we're not trying to talk down to y'all. Y'all are incredible, but this idea that you get out of college and all of a sudden you're, you're a brand or you're going to be able to be a brand. And I always tell people, like, Elliot Wilson now is a brand, but Elliot Wilson never thought he was going to be a brand. That was never my intention. My intention was to wear the uniform of what I was repping and get my uniform dirty and go harder than anybody. So if it was, ego, if it was beat down, beat down. Ego trip, ego trip. Source, the source. I, I got the motherfucking mics. XXL, we're going to be number one. We're going to kill the giant. We're going to be the best ever. Rap Radar, we're changing this whole blog game. Title, motherfuckers are going to respect us. So anything I've done, I, I carry my energy and drive towards making that entity what it needs to be in my judgment. And out of that, my dedication to it has made people realize, okay, this guy's the engine, one of the engines behind that. And who is he? And who's his story? And what he? And what has he done? And now Elliot Wilson and me get more comfortable putting myself out there in front facing and being out there and being the person now people see interview artists. Like all of that is still a big step for me. And I think that that's really what it's about is that you have to be dedicated to something bigger than yourself. And out of being dedicated to something bigger than yourself, yourself, will, you will be recognized and you, you will figure out what you are and what makes you special in this place. The same way you make, the same way it's decided that you, what events you get invited to, like, oh, we need you at this event because this guy's smart, this guy's whatever. It's the same type of recognition. So it really is about first figuring out that what can you, what do you want to be a part of? What do you, what do you, what do you want to represent? What's missing in the landscape? 
and either trying to join that if it's about joining you know hype beast or about joining any of these other brands like what was your lane like what would you like to ideally be and out of that and your dedication will be people realizing okay this person's part of that and who is this person again and he or she is dope and that's when the branding will begin the slow process of self-branding will begin self-branding in the sense of at least from what I, my experience of what we do is a very long process. Nice, nice, perfect. Thank you for doing this. It's been a great Thank conversation. You. Check out title, man. Tell me how I'm doing. Thorough playlist. Awesome. Yeah. That's today's episode of Soundcheck, and definitely check out Title's Thorough playlist for all the hottest tunes. You can listen to more episodes of Soundcheck and keep up with everything Hype Beast Radio at hypebeast.com slash radio. Subscribe to Soundcheck on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Overcast, or whatever you listen to podcasts on. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at ECM underscore LP and follow Hype Beast Music for more original content and music news. Let us know who you like to have on the show and thank you for listening to Soundcheck.